Uh, I'm thrilled to be with you. I'm thrilled that this is happening. Um, it seems to me that I remember at a family dinner in my native Minneapolis, my mother leaning into me confidentially and saying, whatever you do, don't get your father going on levitation. Now, is that an actual memory or an invention? I have a feeling that a lot of the things I remember, I simply made up, but I'm not certain. I'd, I'd like to think that that happened. It, there's an uncertainty that hangs about it. In 80, I moved to New York City uh, to be a playwright. The young man I'd been living with for the seven years previous had just broken up with me unexpectedly. I was lost. And I think when we're lost is when we ask the big questions of the universe, questions about love and life and mortality and death. At any rate, I, uh, as soon after I arrived in New York, I got myself going on levitation. And it was my New York City theatrical debut at the Venerable Circle Rep in 1984. Um, I'm very grateful to Peter and his Venerable Company for putting together this 2021 Zoom revival of Levitation, and I hope you enjoy it. The early morning of an August night, a yellow porch lamp, a porch swing, chairs, empty clay pots stacked inside each other, the noise of crickets. Headlights swing across the face of the house and come to rest. A car door slams. That brings me back. Reminds me of your school play. Did I frighten you? Good God. Dad, you nearly killed me, that's all. What on earth are you doing out here now in your pajamas? Hmm. Reminds me of that school play you were in. That scene where you came home drunk and couldn't get the keys in the door. Is that the story now? You drunk? For goodness sakes, Dad. What are you doing out here at 2.15 in the morning? On the lawn? Nothing. Sitting. What do you mean, sitting? Hmm. Are you all right? No. Yes. I mean, you scared me half to death, Dad. No, oh, I'm sorry. Killer Dad causes kids cardiac. More on page three. We don't want to wake Mother. I mean, you were waiting up for me. On the lawn, in your pajamas. For you? Oh. <laughs> oh, no. No, for the stars, the shooting stars. Meteor showers predicted for tonight. It's that time of year. No, I wouldn't be waiting up for you. When you come to visit, we want you to know 
you're free to come and go whenever you wish. No, no, I set up a deck chair earlier, just, just over there. A couple of them, and a little folding chair and a jug of orange juice. Oh, uh, you want some? Hmm. Nothing so far though. You were awfully good in that play. Preacher praises prize performance. Who writes the headlines when you're not in New York? Gnomes. And fairies. Maybe I am a little drunk. Well, then you shouldn't drive. And you shouldn't be drunk in the first place. Wow. You? Here? Middle of the night, dressed in your pajamas and waiting for the stars to fall. <sighs> I mean it. This is exactly how I want to remember you. Well, that's what I'm here for, isn't it? I suppose so. Do you do this often? Well, in August I do, oh, when I can. How long are you going to wait? Well, until we hit some. It's not as though they hit us. You see, you know, we run into them. There are swarms of meteors that cross the paths of the Earth's orbit. And every year, on the same day, every year, we run smack into them. And today's the day? Well, different swarms, different days. I see. No, what we'll be seeing tonight are known as the Tears of St. Lawrence. Sit down, Dad. Tell me about it. <clears throat> okay, so 65,000 miles per hour when they enter the atmosphere. Ooh. They're fragments of a comet. Uh, the Perseid Shower, it's called. Where were you? Out. No, I, I wasn't trying to pry. Your mother and I want you to know that when you come home, we're not going to pry, for goodness sake. I appreciate that. No, it's just that you're so sweaty. I was wondering where you were. But not that it matters. Warm August night. It's natural you should sweat. I was out dancing, Dad. Oh, good exercise. Sure. You're in pretty good shape. Pretty good. Made you sweat something awful. Uh-huh. You see Paul? Yes, as a matter of fact. Yes, as a matter of fact? How was he? Ambulatory. I don't know, Dad. I saw him. I didn't speak to him. Mother and I had him up here to dinner not long ago. He was fine then. Good. After dinner, he washed the dishes. That's nice. Does this bother you? No. Good. Oh, before dinner, he mowed the lawn. You two don't talk anymore? Sometimes, not much. You know, I've got a theory that the speed of light is not the speed limit of the universe. No kidding. No, sir, I am not kidding. No, this is a theory that will take Einstein one step further. I've been working on it for the past couple of months, and now I am convinced there is definitely something in the universe which travels faster than light. What? I'm not sure. No, 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 I mean, I'm not sure I want to say just yet. Not until I've had a chance to develop my theory a little more. 
You want a beer, Reverend? The thing to remember is that things here are not what they seem. Tonight, especially. Especially tonight. A beer. Go ahead. Mom's asleep. <clears throat> are you sure you should have another? Positive. Well, in that case, yeah, I'll join you. Just one now. That's all you're getting. Parson poses speedy theory. Fire from heaven, miracle or menace? Pop to Einstein, drop dead. This could get a little tiring. Oh, gosh, Dad. Don't I know it? Hey, you're pretty good at it, aren't you? When it comes to alliteration, nobody can touch me. Then you should be proud of what you do. Ruined writer holds head high. Finds meaning in macrame. I'm serious. Oh, my. Oh, maybe, maybe you didn't always write plays about death. What? Well, people might warm to your work a little more. I do not always write plays about death. Or, you know, crippling diseases, patricide, fratricide. Dad. Ulcers. What was the title of that last play? Her final summer. There. You see? I, I don't mean to criticize, but well, something's always dying. Damn it, Dad. Something always is. And I do mean to criticize. Well, for that matter, of course, uh, I'm dying. Don't say that. So's your mother. Oh, so are you. You intend to attack the entire system? Maybe. Come on, Dad. It's it, too late to talk about this. I'll say. Oh, it's been going on for quite some time. As far as I'm concerned, it's been going on for exactly 29 years, and I will not be reconciled to it. I'm too tired to talk about it tonight. Besides, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm through with all that. All what? The writing... The rejection, New York, all of it. I'm not going back. You're not going back? Nope. Fine. Where are you going? Nowhere. There, you see? Dad, I'm staying here, that's all. And I don't want to talk about it tonight. No. All right. All right. Case closed. Good. Subject dropped. Finny. Finny. Of course, <clears throat> all of us are hit by several meteorites a week, but they're the kind that weigh a billionth of a gram and fall at the speed of two feet per minute. Now that's slow. Can you picture it? Tiny fragments of the cosmos, utterly ancient, descending on our bodies with such deliberation. Carry moonbeams home in a jar. It's no joke, says Potty Padre. But the odds are that a more sizable meteorite will strike one human being once every 9,300 years. So stick around. The all I'm saying is, people are in need. They need miracles. 
They're tired of cynicism. They're looking for salvation. And you offer them death. Oh, well, though I hope you don't think I'm criticizing. No. Never. You have real gifts. Thank you. And a real kindness. And we were thrilled when you called from the airport this afternoon. I'm glad. Thrilled. Good. Say, you do know where all the papers are, don't you? Uh, the deed to the house, the will. You gave me a complete rundown. The key to the safety deposit box. Now, not that you're going to, well, find much in there, of course. Yeah, a copy of that thing I've been writing about time and travel. Uh, Jean's engagement announcement from the paper, that sort of thing. Please, Dad. <laughs> An autograph I got when I was 10 years old. There. Where? Gosh. That was lovely. What? You didn't see it? I must have missed it. How could you miss it? It went right across the sky. I'm very observant. It was beautiful. Well, I'm, I'm glad you spotted it anyway. There'll be others. Oh, I know. One meteor does not a shower make. No, indeed. I had a wonderful teacher when I was a boy. Oh, maybe seven years old. An old maid. Oh, they called her, but she was anything but that. Uh, of course, she was old. Uh, retirement age when she taught me, I suppose. And I have no doubt she was a maiden. But she was completely alive. Miss Thorvaldson. Miss Thorvaldson. And I remember one afternoon in late winter, she asked if there was anyone in class who knew when the buds appear in spring. That was a trick question, of course. So I raised my hand and said, they don't. The buds appear in the fall as soon as the old leaves drop. And Miss Thorvaldson said, now here is an observant boy. Now here is an observing boy. Put your shirt on, Joe. You're all sweaty. Ada, did we wake you? You might have. I don't know. I couldn't sleep. Put your shirt on, Joe. Hi, Mom. Well, what is all this? Shooting stars. Put your shirt on. Don't be stubborn. My shirt is as sweaty as me. As sweaty as I. As sweaty as I. You always were stubborn. Hmm. We were watching for meteors. Your favorite word was no, always. You were 16 months old when you learned it. And it was the happiest day of your life. Have you seen Paul? No. There. You see? All the time, no. Oh, but you did see him. You told me. Will you leave me alone about Paul? What is this fascination with him? We love him. Right. Right. No. I'm sorry. I'll go and get you a dry shirt. No, no, I've got one. Don't bother. He was out dancing. How'd you pry that out of him? Oh, it wasn't easy. Do you do much dancing in New York? Not really. I was never a big dancer. 
No, neither was I. But that's how you met your friend, isn't it? What friend? Ada. I mean, if you wanted to meet nice people your own age, you'd go out dancing or some such thing. Isn't that it? For goodness sake, Ada. I know, I know. What are you two up to here? Oh, you know. Oh, nothing. Absolutely no, nothing. going and she doesn't know when to stop. I try to make a little conversation and people jump all over you. What? Oh, my. Jeez. What? Beautiful. Wasn't it? Shoot. Didn't you see it, Arthur? Not again, Dad. Well, maybe just out of the corner of my eye. Oh, another. What a night. I'll go and get you a shirt. It's so late. Why don't we all go in? Come on, Mom. Dad's been waiting here for hours and he still hasn't seen one yet. I don't understand it. I am a very observing person. He doesn't need to see any shooting stars, for goodness sake, at something o'clock in the morning. Can't you just let things happen for once? It's important to him. Just let things happen for once? Just let it happen. What is that? Some phrase? I don't know why you're picking on me. I'm not. I mean, it's not going to kill you any of us to sit on the porch at 2.30 and look at the sky, is it? Just let it happen, ma'am. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I give up. No, no. I'm going to sit here and be spontaneous. Well, do you notice anything different? Uh, your hair? Oh, no. It just gets more and more grey in it. No surprises there. Something here is different, though. I give up. Go on. Guess. No. Do you want me to tell you if you're getting warmer? No. Do you mean you give up? Yes. Yes. Dad lowered the porch swing. Wow. My feet can finally touch the floor. For years, I have hated the swing. My entire life, I've been sitting in chairs that made me feel insignificant. Keep feet on floor, says Midwestern mom. Oh, you smell like potatoes. Thanks. It's my aftershave. You feel more significant now? Not really. When I was a child, my teachers would say, we'll let the littlest girl in the class answer that one. Can you imagine how that made me feel? No. Your father is really thoughtful, even when he has to be reminded to be. After 26 years living in this house, my feet dangling in the air every summer, one day he just ups and lowers the swing. A remarkably kind man. You're thin. Do you know how thin you are? That says I look good. He would. He's not an observant person. I'm not thin. You're terribly thin. Mom, I'm a balloon. You're gaunt. You can see the bones in your face. You look like your great uncle Bredar looked just before he started eating wood. <laughs> well, maybe it runs in the family. A long line of unrequited hunger. You look like a skeleton. Is that a beer? Is that a bottle of beer? No, it's a medieval wind instrument. 
No, it's not. It's a bottle of beer you're drinking. I thought it would fatten me up. A steady diet of cigarettes and beer. Oh, yes. Did he have one, too? Boy, oh, boy. Would you like one? No, I would not like one. Out here, where everyone can see me. Everyone? Mom, it's 2.30. There's no one going to see you. They're out there. Perhaps just a little of yours. I'm so dry. Ugh, awful. Tastes like potatoes. Oh. What on earth is keeping Dad? How is he? I mean, how's his health? Oh, he's fine. No, I mean it. How are you? Old. Oh, Mom. Don't say that. Why not? I don't know. I just can't stand to hear you say it, that's all. All right. I'll say something else. Except I don't quite know how else to put it. Oh, I don't mean that I feel different than I ever did, except for in my body, of course. It's funny. The voice in my head is the same as when I was 18 or 12 or 60. I am the same person. I keep waiting for that to change, but it doesn't. I keep waiting for some of that wisdom that's supposed to come with age, but I have a feeling it's just not coming. When I was a young woman, when I was having the first of the children, I remember pitying people who were 40. Poor things, I thought. 40 years old. Well, that's 40 years ago now. <laughs> Where did you eat supper? Uh, that new French restaurant opened in St. Paul. With who? A couple of friends from the dispatch. I miss you, Mom. I miss Dad. Well, we miss you too. What did you have? You smell like garlic. I woke up in New York this morning and realized just how much I miss you. I don't have another. I, I worry about you. What have you heard about me? Is dad keeping something from me? No, 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 no. Dad's not keeping anything from you. You're fine. Of course I'm not fine. My arthritis is a constant torment. Ah, oh, jeez. Like that, it's out of control. It's out of control? Oh my God. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Did dad call secretly and tell you to come? No, I'm as fearful for him as I am for you. You mean he has it too? Mom, nobody has anything. I'm sorry I brought it up, whatever it was. I wish you wouldn't frighten me like that. I suppose I'm just missing the two of you. That's all. Well, if you miss us so much, don't you think you could have eaten with us on your first night home? Ah, uh, maybe we should turn in. I'll never get to sleep now. Last night, Dad and I were sitting here and a family of ducks waddled out from behind that clump of pines, crossed the road and disappeared down over the riverbanks. She reminded me of me. Who? The mother duck. She looked so ragged. <laughs> You're too much, Mom. She looked completely exhausted. Domestic abuse among the ducks. It could happen in your own backyard. Dad said he'd invited them. The ducks? He's forever inviting. I don't know, Joe. He's fine, but 
But what? Just promise me one thing. Sure. Whatever you do, don't get your father going on levitation. Hi, Uncle Joe! Where are you gonna sleep? What are you doing up? Mike! Wow! Wow, good, good to see you. Yeah. Great, what's he doing here? What are you doing up at this hour? What's he doing here? Mike, great, uh, you look terrific. I'm just trying to figure out why it's you I'm seeing here. <gasps> wow! Was that a shooting star? Oh, it's just not fair. I guess I didn't quite realize we had other guests. You don't know the half of it, believe me. Now, what are you doing out of bed? Uh, Grandpa came into Uncle Joe's old room and woke me up. I didn't want to go through Joe's bags. Uh, I want Joe to know that whenever he visits, I'm not going to go through his bags. Yeah, he woke me up to ask if he could borrow one of my shirts. Arthur. It's okay. I don't think he woke Tom. At the risk of oh. being... What's everybody doing? At the risk of being indelicate, who's Tom? Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Oh, well, in that case. We're on our way to Oboe Camp. Gotta be kidding. This year, I'm gonna make first chair and my life saving certificate. Oboe Camp. Your mother won't be happy if she finds you up. His mother? Is Jean here too? What's she doing in town? Well, bringing you to Oboe Camp. Why don't you tell me these things? Oh, actually, Joe, you're the surprise guest here. Uh, all the others were expected, uh, yeah, more or less. I see. Not that we're not thrilled to see you. We are very. We were just wondering what prompted, if there was anything. He told me he's not going back. Well, where's he going? Nowhere. He told me he's afraid of death. I did not. Well, not in so many words, perhaps. Who's death? Ours. Jeez. What do you mean? Did he come out here to prevent it or to witness it? Don't ask me. Well, uh, here's that shirt for you. Dad, this is a sweatshirt. It's over 80 degrees. Dad. So, did you come all the way from New York to see Paul? Have you met the guy he's living with now? I have. Michael? Do you miss him? Not anymore. Oh, uh, see, I do. You know, I was five when he moved in with you and like 15 when he moved out, so... That makes him like a part of my life too, and even though we didn't get here to the cities all that often, I, I had a really good time with you guys when we did, and so I miss him. Don't you? Hmm? I mean, I know we're not supposed to talk about it, so. <gasps> I'm the Sheik of Araby. <laughs> What are you, 30? 29. Same difference. What's New York like? An incubator. <laughs> I think I'm safe in saying that neither of us wants to die just yet. There's so much more that we want to do and see and know. I know. But have you ever considered the alternative? Just being here? Eternally? No, I don't suppose you have. You're too young. Young? He's nearly 30. Be careful, Michael. You remember that camping trip we took up north, Joe, to Itasca State Park? I was seven. And we saw that little rivulet come bubbling up out of the rock. Just... A tiny little stream that you stepped over. 
I remember. Well, that's the same Mississippi River that's across the road. Picture it. If it didn't go on out to the Gulf eventually, it's if it just accumulated in some unspeakably massive lake, like the Dead Sea. Dad, it's awfully late. How stagnant. How repellent. I don't buy it, Dad. You don't have to. By no means. I mean, you don't tell somebody who's about to die about the Mississippi River, for God's sake. Or some man whose wife and son or father just kicked the bucket from emphysema or a mugging in the park. You don't tell him about streams or about the natural order of things. Michael, you go on back to bed now. <laughs> what do you tell them about? I don't know. Futility? I don't know. Futility? We're all going back to bed. There's nothing happening out here. You can say that again. So, what are you doing out here, Grandpa? Looking for meteors. You mean, you mean there's going to be more? More? More of what? Wow! Okay, I'm going to wake up Tom! Don't you dare! I'm beginning to get a distinct sense of unreality here. I wonder why, Father. So do I. It's about time. Many very early men ate juicy steaks using no plates. What? It's a mnemonic device for remembering the order of the planets out from the sun. Many very early men, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Eight, that stands for the asteroid belt. Juicy stakes, Jupiter and Saturn, using no plates. Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Pluto. Comes in handy. I'm sure. Might make a page three headline for the post. No plates for early stakes. So this is what people do in the Midwest, huh? Pretend to go to bed at 10.30 so they can sneak back at three? Hi, <laughs> It's fun. I like it. Good morning, Mrs. Dahl. Reverend Dahl. Top of the morning to you, Joe. Oh, Ira, I can't tell you how sorry I am we woke you up. Waiting up for meteor showers. I mean, normally we uh, don't. I'm my grandson has been slamming I'm doors. I'm so and embarrassed. A out of hand. Listen, listen, listen. I'm very flexible. Ira, what on earth do you... You know him? Do they know? Please. We've had supper together. And very delicious it was, Mrs. Dahl. Swedish meatballs, Joe. Do call me Ada. Or Mrs. Dahl, if you prefer. <laughs> or anything. Phoebe? <laughs> Dolores! Would you like some hot milk? Oh, I think you'll have to give me a little more time to get used to your traditions. But thanks, Ada. <laughs> Believe me. Ira, how... Is that what you're wearing? Well, I think so. You'll catch your death of cold in that. Well, given the temperature here, I doubt it. But if I do, I hope I leave you with fond memories. <laughs> <laughs> Did your friend always talk like this, Joe? Ceaselessly. He kept me laughing all evening. Well, lady, you got off some pretty decent one-liners yourself. Right in the middle of supper, your mother suggested we all take naps between the meatballs and the mince pie. I don't believe this. Ira, why are you here? No. Ira arrived late this afternoon, soon after you went out. Prize. We put you both in the basement bedroom, I'm afraid. I hope it's not damp. 
fine with me. Hi, Ra. Oh, what? Joe, you're looking at me like I'm spouting mushrooms. Shut up, Ira. I think I will take some hot milk. Hot milk? I'll take a cup, Ada. I hear one cup. Do I hear two? I pass. No thanks, Mom. Going, going, gone. Ira, what the hell are you doing here? When did you leave New York? How did you find my parents? I found them utterly unbelievable. <laughs> and I begin to understand you. I mean, you come from completely queer stock. How long you say uh, you two have known each other? A couple of weeks, for goodness sake. It'll be three months tomorrow. Well, I hope you didn't think this was the point where I'd want to take you to meet the, whole, meet the folks. Just think of it, Joe. Mr. Sherman has incorporated himself, and he's only... Uh, how old did you say, Ira? 24. 24 years old, and already he's running his own private catering business. You told him about the naked chef? Why not? We do wedding parties, birthdays, shivas. Shivas? I think you people call them wakes. Sitting Shiva, you, you cover up the mirrors, you remember the dead, and you eat. What is going on here? Say, Joe, now why don't you write about your friend here? There must be interesting stories in private catering. Oh, there are seven million interesting oh, stories yeah, I mean, at the Naked Cake. Come 40 on, old, uh, 40 old minutes. Sit down. Join us. So your father was telling us all about the universe at supper. Hey, you should have been there. What was that passage you quoted, Mr. Dahl? Hmm. Kealif shanem behai nechu keyomat mol keyavor veashmora vali le. Four years I went to Hebrew school. Did I get anywhere? Don't ask. Psalm 90. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Oh, look, there's one! There's one! Can you see it? Yes, I see it. <laughs> An airplane, Ira. Oh, yeah. But so, mom, please, Tom will kill me if I don't wake him up for this. That's nothing to what I'll do to you if you do. <sighs> Hi, Joe. Jean? How are you? It's good to see you. A real surprise. Mom, please. You look good. Where's your shirt? Mom says I look like a skeleton. Of course. At death's door, no doubt. Exactly. Ma! Forget it, Mike! <sighs> Hello again, Jean. Hello. Dad? I know. I'm afraid I woke him. Yeah, but why did she have to get up? Come on, kid. Don't be a pain in the ass. Please don't use that language with my son. Oh, language? Oh, you mean English? All right, I I'll put it another way. Mike, you're a nice kid. You play a dynamite oboe after supper. But please, just try not to make everybody's seat hurt. Will you? Is Besser... You go off to bed now, Michael. We were just speaking of aeroplanes. You know, I can remember the first aeroplane I ever saw. Quite an event. And to think what has transpired in the heavens just in my lifetime. 
levitation, a miracle. It just dropped out of the sky. I don't suppose you know what short pants are, do you, Michael? What? Short pants. No, oh, well, it doesn't matter. But all of us boys were wearing them, which means uh, that I must have been less than 10 years old at the time, and that it was a day in summer when the first aeroplane dropped out of the sky. Michael, never forget the advantages you and I have over these city boys here, having known the unutterable pleasures of growing up in a small town. I don't know. I don't think it's so great. Oh, you will. Anyway, now I don't know what we were all doing that we all happened to be in that field south of town, or, well, perhaps we all just came running when we saw that creature in the sky dipping its wings and descending. It bounced twice, very high, then rolled to a stop in the long grass. And a god stepped out. <laughs> he was tall and laughing and buttoned up in a stiff white collar and dark suit, although it was a summer's day. And he was undeniably from another world. Well, by that time, of course, some of the grown-ups had run out to the field, and to our profound dismay, they took the fellow off to feed him and fawn over him. And we stood guard over his chariot, half protection, half fearful of it. Well, I know now that he was making a coast-to-coast -coast flight, some record or other, but to us, he was spreading the gospel of levitation. All right, who got him started? Joe, did you get him started? Shh, Mom, please. When it came time for him to fly away, my goodness, what a thought that was then still laughing, all teeth and mustache and bright eyes. He threw out long ropes from the cockpit and the strongest of the men held them until the tiny engine had worked up enough power. And then he was gone from us, trailing little ribbons of rope and dipping his wings and disappearing. I knew I was right to make more than two cups. You'll have some hot milk, won't you, Jean? Thanks, Mum. And there's more coming, so don't be shy. Michael? Oh, uh, <clears throat> no thanks, Grandma. Michael? I don't care for any, all right? I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, Mr. Sherman. Are you sure you have enough? There's so many comings and goings in this house, especially as we get older, it seems. I never know who Dad is going to invite, or when, or how many. So I always make plenty of everything. <laughs> oh, there you are. Thank you so much. Arthur? Oh, please. Uh, Joe, it will let you sleep. So much better for, for you than all those cigarettes and beers. Hmm. Not much sleep tonight, I'm afraid. Sleeping or waking, it's all the same to me. Um, who is that? Oh, for goodness sake, Joe. Can't you just let things happen for once? Mike, take some hot milk. In case you didn't happen to know, too much milk can cause excess mucus. If you're angling for one of Joe's beers, you're going to have to do a lot better than excess mucus. Dad, do you know what I would like? 
Uh, I'm afraid I do. You want me to make popcorn? Well, we do seem to be up. Now then, that would be a treat. Popcorn. All right. All right. I submit to the will of the majority. <laughs> so, what is it exactly that we are doing? Uh, I'm not sure you can pin it down exactly. Oh, what was that? Where? Wow! Where? Where? Dad's waiting for a meteorite shower. Oh! Stargazing, aren't we? Hardly. Here's a newcomer, Gene. Could this be your brother? How do you do? How do you do? Well, it's not a great deal of family resemblance, is there? I don't know that I would have taken you for brother and sister. Maybe not, but we both have identical birthmarks in exactly the same place. So there must be some connection. Oh, you mean that thing that looks like a map of Italy on the inside of your left thigh? <laughs> you got it too, Jean, huh? I myself have never traveled in Europe. What about that popcorn, Papa? Ah, uh, as soon as I turn my back, it'll all start. I just know it. What a vast expanse of lawn you have here, Ada. You could hold a cotillion on the green. Joe used to hang lights from the trees and stage Hollywood spectaculars out there. He recruited <laughs> me to lead a chorus line of neighborhood <laughs> girls one summer. <laughs> All of us in swimsuits and cape. Which he recruited me to make. Hey, if only you knew then where it was all gonna lead, huh? <laughs> Why don't you write plays like that anymore, Joe? With dancing and singing. I'll get right on to it, Mom. I don't know why I should be so hungry, but I feel like something more substantial than popcorn. It's no wonder. The meatballs were so dry, people hardly touched them. Not at all, Ada. Mike, uh, you want to get that popcorn started? If I can wake up Tom. Not a chance. Okay. But Tom's going to be pretty mad about this. That's all I have to say. Ada, what about muffins? I don't suppose they really go with popcorn, but I have such a craving. Well... I won't make much more than a couple dozen. Cracked wheat? Cracked wheat? Why not? Why not muffins and then we can all dance around on the lawn? Now you've gone and done it. I was raised in a strict Lutheran parsonage, show, as were you. I don't even know how to walk. Arthur? Uh, coming, Ada. Coming. Fred, I dozed off in that deck chair over there. <clears throat> Did Arthur call it a night? Oh, <laughs> you must be uh, Arthur's son, Joseph. You know, your father is a remarkable man. Now, Einstein, who I met once, by the way, at some sort of awards banquet in New Jersey, Einstein said that as an object approaches the speed of light, time slows down, at least for the object it does, and that if anything were capable of traveling faster than light, time itself would be reversed. It would go backwards. <laughs> Well, says Arthur, with not a shred of scientific jargon, but with total assurance nonetheless, well, he says, what do we know that travels backwards in time? What indeed, he says, but memory. <laughs> well, I didn't think I could let him get away with that sort of mystical double talk, but he goes on to insist that we make our mistake when we think of memory as an abstract concept. He maintains that it's quantifiable, the old coot. 
uh, and that we've lost sight of that, but that vestiges of an ancient understanding of memory can still be found in language. Do we not, he asks, do we not say, I have so many memories, or that so-and-so has lost his memory? Quantifiable. <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, ah, I seem to have polished off Arthur's orange juice, and I was wondering if there was any more. I just yell if anything starts happening. <sighs> ah! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Everything's fine. Everything's all right. I'm sorry. Just a, a whim. Nice night. Sorry, false alarm. We uh, thought we spotted the Hindenburg. Never mind. So, <clears throat> here dinner too? Of course. So, Joe, what's all this about Deb? Where did she hear that? Out in the kitchen. Mike announced that Uncle Joe was freaking out about Grandma and Grandpa dying. He said that I'll kill him. It's not true. Well, freaking out? No. You let him use cheap phrases like that? Actually, that was my phrase. What Mike said was that you were having problems coming to grips. <laughs> that kid's got a future in California. What about it, Joe? Mom and Dad's death. Well, I mean, doesn't the thought, doesn't it nearly kill you? Am I alone in this? Completely odd or clinging or dependent or something? What do you mean? What I mean is that I live 1,200 miles away and I have a life of my own, such as it is. And yet, whenever I feel time slipping away from me, and it does, oh God, it does, it's their time I'm feeling. It's those two slipping away from me. And I, I nearly die of it. And I want to know, am I alone in this? No. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, that sounds bad. I picture coming back to this house, not finding them in it. And I can't picture that. That's what death is for me, looking for someone, and you can't find them. Throughout the empty house, one room to another, no matter how many times you search again and again, you can't find them. You won't ever find them. Who was that man? I guess all that started for me when the kids came along. Each one of them gave a new meaning to the phrase hanging on for dear life. Because that's what I did to them. At least to begin with. I suppose that's what I did to you too, Joe, when I was a kid. Sure. Tie your shoes, wipe your nose, cut your hair, chew your food, don't slurp the soup. And that was the advice she was giving me while I was in college. Eventually, of course, you learn to let go. You learn you don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were the hardest to let go of because you were the one who taught me to cling. My mother dies two years ago. Cancer. I'm sorry. And she was an accountant for the Mafia. Oh, for Pete's sake. No, she was. If you ever need something to fall back on, Ira, she'd say to me, she'd say, Ira, become a bookkeeper for the Mafia. They hire them by the gross. I thought you were being serious for once. I am serious. So was Irene. I mean, she kept the books for some piss elegant hotel in Midtown. Very... Old English, you know, with old oak paneling and the sort of doorman who wouldn't look at you if you weren't a was, much less tell you a cab. And in the role of president, a proprietor, 
whatever, was this cultivated white haired ex headmaster. But you know that the power behind the throne was some guy called Nancio or Bugsy or something, and that he was only running the place for his great uncle Starface. <laughs> anyway, Irene got cancer. Only nobody in the family, including her, Nobody was allowed to use that word. My aunts would get together when Irene wasn't around and say she had the real one. The real one? What? Sounds like an aspartate cola. Can you ever be anything but flippant? Sure. But I tried to live up to people's expectations of me. Like this whole astronomy thing. Oh, you want flippant? You got it. Like I was telling your father earlier, last summer, there was this total eclipse of the sun. And all day long on the radio, they kept saying, don't look at it, it'll ruin your eyes. So I said to my friend, Gay Morris, I said, Gay Morris, if these eclipses are so bad for you, why do they have them? <laughs> there you see, simple. That's amazing. I mean, how do you do that? Amazing. It isn't even interesting. It's what you're taught to do. So anyway, Irene died and my father, Eugene, well, he sold belts wholesale before he retired and he was always pretty much all right with me, as was Irene. By the way, suddenly he turned into this, this sad old guy. There's only my sister Ruth and me left, and Ruth is married and lives in Bayshore, so Daddy and I go for little bachelor dinners once every week in the city, and in one way he's cool, because, well, Ruth can and is handling the whole grandchildren thing, I mean, providing them for him, but in another sense, it's a little depressing every Wednesday, because, because sometimes Eugene forgets to shave which in him is a thing almost impossible to conceive. I'm sorry about your mother, Ira. Yeah. Thanks. Hear that? Patronizing. Condescending. What? What? It's what she does. When Paul split, she sat me down to talk about historical inevitability. It wasn't that way. Patronizing, wow. I'm bleeding for God's sake and she's telling me it's for my own good, politically? Can you believe it? That it's time for me to move on to get outside of myself? All right, all right, my timing was... Uh... She's militant, my sister. Oh yeah, <laughs> Marx and Jesus. I see, we're gonna start with a Christian Marxist again? You gotta watch your step around her, believe me. Watch your politics, watch your language, your thoughts. He attacks the things he doesn't understand. It's what he does. And that's what I'm here for, I guess. The Christian Marxists? You see, we're a couple of do-gooders, my husband and I. And me, I'm an aging earth mother. <laughs> earnest, my God, she's earnest. And that's a big mistake, I know. Feudal, right? Try to feed hungry people? Pointless. Take homeless people into your home? Forget it. You see, Marx and Jesus have a lot in common, Ira. For one thing, neither of them has much time for queers. Neither one of them says a damn thing about any of that. But both of them have a hell of a lot to say about cynics. Oh yeah, she's the champion of all the right causes. When it comes to perverts, well, let's just say she wouldn't want her son to marry one. I see. And that is precisely what he wants to believe. I see. I have a house full of children who idolize their Uncle Joel. And my husband and I love him more than he'll ever admit. And can you blame us if we didn't want to see him bogged down in a basically dead-end lifestyle? Hey, not me, not me. That lifestyle was Paul. And he wasn't a lifestyle. He was my life. 
and her kids loved him, so did mom and dad, and they're not even liberals. And where did she get off with this basically dead-end bullshit? She and Jerry showed Paul the last word in courteous contempt, and he felt it. We did not. For seven years, they did. Did not. Did. Did. He left you. I know. He left him. He knows. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. It's all he ever talks about. So you've decided that Jerry and I are the villains and you ridicule our work, which is not with the right causes in the least, and he knows it. And he never answers our letters. And you never answer our letters. And besides, what have you ever done for anybody? What stand has he ever taken? <laughs> and how can you possibly be so smug and self-righteous when you spent the past year shying away from any sort of commitment and trying your damnness to pose as some sort of cold fish, for God's sake? You say? Shut up, Ira. Don't talk to him like that. Why not? I don't know. I... Maybe... I don't understand completely yet, but I'm trying. I've been trying. And you make it impossible for me to open my mouth without first examining my entire structure of belief. And how can you dare do that when you don't demand the same of yourself? I loved him. I miss him. I know that. He acts like I don't know that. I know that. And now... Because maybe I made some mistakes at one point. Am I dead to you? Would you let me be dead to you? Every Christmas, it was Paul who picked out the presents for the kids every year. Sherlock Holmes and sheet music for Mike. Necklaces and pins for uh, uh, Trey. Necklaces and pins for Trey. Picture books about uh, horses for for Vin. And he wrecked her set once for George, and he got that second hand at the Salvation Army. Jesus. For Pilar drawing books and those pens with different colors of ink in them. There was a dictionary for Quamey one year and a dollhouse for Rebecca. Oh my God. God. And always puppets for... What's her name? I forget. I can't remember. Mom, which one always got the puppets? The what? Pan puppets. Uh, marionettes. Dummies. <laughs> I don't know. Wasn't it the one with all those wires in her teeth? How many of them are there? Oh, you don't know the half of it, believe me. Mother, please don't make me sound like a factory. Some of them adopted from all over. Which ones? It's so hard to remember. Well, Michael for one. Judith, hand puppets, marionettes, dummies. <laughs> We've got Mike in Chicago. Wow. Uh, does this have anything to do with the Christian Marxism? It's a long story. I was crazy about them all. But I don't know where to get a kid for Christmas. So it was Paul who took such care. It's like he's dead, isn't it? Uh-huh. But he's not. I know. He mows our lawn. I know. Neither is your sister dead. I know. When you were born, I was having a hard time. And you were so very sick. We both were, but we nearly lost you. 
one night we realized you could be gone before morning. And so we baptized you right there in the parsonage. And your sister was your godmother. And because I was so very sick, it was Jean who stayed up with you all through the night, night after night. And she insisted that you live. I know. Oh, you still haven't got a shirt on. I know. Cold. I know. I'll go get you one. No. Sure I will. Wait. Wait. Listen. Shh. We're listening. What for? We don't know. Hear that? It's the first bird. There's always one. The birds don't just wake up together and burst into song. There's always one that takes the lead. Way before dawn. Sings along for about half an hour. Before the other birds join in. All along. I've been listening to him for years. When I'm writing all night, when I used to write all night, the moment he began, I felt like I could finish. It's the same bird, always, everywhere. Many's the time I've wanted to kill that bird. You know what you mean? Uh -huh. Me too. I'll go get you that shirt. That's what they all say. I mean it, Mom. There's four more bowls of this stuff in the kitchen, and if I don't wake up, Tom... Michael, Michael, just go and help your grandfather, huh? Mom? You heard what Ira said. So who's Ira all of a sudden? Ira is Ira. No kidding. Sometimes, not often. Almost never. Hey, Mike, you want a hand in the kitchen? Oh, that's okay. See, I mainly just wanted Tommy to meet Uncle Joe because Tommy's gay too, so. Tommy is what? Well, he's not sure, but he thinks he might be. So he's decided, you know, just to give it some time to find out. You're all expecting maybe he glows in the dark? Didn't you know about Tommy, Mom? Didn't you guess? We'll talk about it later. I thought after that cost you took, you'd be sussed. Of course. Mike, that's enough. <sighs> Fine. After all that stuff went down between you and her, she enrolled in a class on human sexuality. <laughs> to understand you better. <laughs> it must have been a good one. She wouldn't let me see the textbooks. I'll go get you that shirt. You want some popcorn? Thank you, Michael. Oh, Mr. Wright says your muffins are almost done. Would you mind checking on them for me, Ada? I think I need to sit a while. Not at all. Mr. Wright. You might try to talk him out of staying here while you're at it. Who, Joe? Staying here? He says he's not going back. Oh, I don't talk anyone in and out of anything anymore. Ada, I am not a school teacher. Well, whatever. Mm. Come on, Mike. I mean, he's perfectly welcome to stay if he wants. But I just think there comes a time, don't you? I'll say. Want some, Joe? Ira? Huh? Not right now. Thanks. Well, here if you want it. 
Joe, Joe, you, you're not coming back? I would have written to you. Terrific. I had dinner with some friends from the local paper. I can get my old job back. What? And what was that, hey? Paper boy? What about the plays? Finished. What about Paul? Dead issues. That's not why I'm staying. What about me? What do you mean? Well, what about me? I'm not dead. Who said you were? Oh, I don't know. Every now and then I, I, I seem to get a little news bulletin, a, a little flash announcement. Ira Sherman, only son of Eugene and Irene, named Baumgartner Sherman, passed away on his knees today begging for attention. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, somehow that doesn't surprise me. Somehow that doesn't come as a shock of a lifetime, you know? What happens is, is first your eyes glaze over. <laughs> like when I'm laying bare the secrets of my soul or some such thing, and then you have a little sigh or two. For God's sake, and I, I, I just cease to be. What's happened is you've climbed into your little time machine and gunned the engines back to the era of Paul the Great. Ira, please, I don't want to see him right now. For me, you do not get seeds. For three months, I've been waiting to make an entrance. Are you boys talking about relationships? You have no way of understanding me. Oh, God. The presumption of the man. You haven't been through the ringer. That's all I meant. Sweetheart, you do not have to go through the ringer when you are born in the rack. You, with your mince pie, with Midwestern upbringing, your parents you can eat for dessert who say to you, oh, you're gay? Well, that's okay. And, oh, this is the boy you love? Well, we'll love him too. And now you're blue? Well, we'll feel it with you. Um, you're talking about going through some sort of ringer. You're a sissy. That's what you are. You're a fucking coward. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm afraid. Translation, Inga, he's afraid I'll do to him what the legendary Paul did to him. Although just what that might be is a little hard to pin down. I mean, what was the poor guy guilty of, huh? I'm sure I don't know. Well, lady, neither do I. Look, are you going to let me have some of that popcorn or not? Well, certainly. <sighs> He didn't live happily ever after with him. That's what he did. First love was supposed to last forever. Christ. I just didn't want to die alone. Oh, God. Always thinking ahead. Well, one of you would have had to, don't you think? At last. Some logic. Thank you. Tell me, do you Midwesterners have some kind of thing about first love? I know I did. Well, then you're both so naive I could choke. Joe, all this pain, and you never once call on me. Even when we're together, you, you have never once called on me. It's not as if I didn't want to. Oh, shut up, Joe. <sighs> well, why don't you just come and sit down and have some popcorn? Oh! And your father said there weren't any shooting stars tonight. <sighs> Midnight <sighs> Madness in Mystery Lodge. Oh, Joe, do not start. I did, I did hear you ringing, you know, the phone and the buzzer. I figured you just unplugged it, the phone. Well, eventually. Why did you do it, Joe? What's he done now? 
He locked me out all this past week. He locked everybody out. No one could get through. It was very hot. Hot. <laughs> we were watching TV in his apartment. I was watching TV. He was sitting in a chair watching the wall as far as I could tell. Fun couple. So I say, I, I go out for a Chinese takeaway. And when I got back, he wouldn't buzz me back in. What did you do that night? Do? Well, I'm sitting on the stoop. It's 97 degrees and I'm thinking, well, chow mein was a pretty stupid idea. You mean nobody's seen him for a week? I wasn't watching the wall. I was watching your face and all I could see was a death's head. Thanks. No, no. It's a nice face, really. It's just, it's just that everyone I saw looked so unmistakably doomed. And everything I had, everything I was going to lose. <sighs> One way or the other. And the city was an incubator for the stillborn. After a week of that, it was either get myself into a plane and fly out here or... I don't know. Never buzz anybody in again. You write headlines for a newspaper in New York City. Until recently. Just the headlines? Just some of them. Do you play sports? Well, you should. You should play golf. Writers like golf. Myself, I never married, so I wouldn't know what to advise you. And I don't pretend to understand a thing about young men who seemingly marry each other. I come from a different generation, different world it was, so you could hardly expect me to understand. Although I've always had a hearty interest in anthropology. What's to understand? Think of us as hunters and gatherers. He hunts, I gather. It's crazy, but it works. Oh, no, no, no. I've got to hold on all that. What I don't understand is this. Now, here is this perfectly nice young man. Intelligent, very good looking. I know he's Jewish, but anyway, you won't believe this, Mr. Sherman, but you're the first Jewish person I've ever met to talk to. Oh, I believe... I'm afraid that out here, and during my years, we, we were very limited in our experience, although I do have one East Coast friend from way back, an inventor. He, well, he just dropped out of the sky one summer afternoon and into my life. But anyway, we struck up acquaintance, and then many years of correspondence and occasional visits, and he's the son of a Methodist bishop and not Jewish at all. And I suppose not really East Coast, but Midwestern, although once he became famous, which was a few years before I met him, he spent much of his time in the East, which is why I think of him like that, as East. Anyway, here's this intelligent young man, and it's obvious he cares about you very much. He sang your praises all through supper, and he says he thinks you're a very good writer although he does allow that you are perhaps a bit morbid. And anyway, he loves you, so what's the problem? That's, that's what I don't understand. What is it that that Paul thing, but that's history, isn't it? When I say I'm from another generation, Joe, I don't mean I've stayed there. That would be a waste. I live now in people's memories, and so do you. Isn't that a thought? It's what your father was talking about at dinner, that every moment you live, you're planting seeds in people's minds, seeds of yourself, and they keep you alive, not in some fixed form, but always changing, because of course there's nothing so unreliable as the human mind. 
But in a sense, nothing so predictable at the same time. So that while you are there, always, you may end up becoming many different people. As many different people as the seeds you've planted. What do you mean he hurts you gather? He's unfaithful? Hmm. Only to himself, Mrs. Thorvaldson. Only to himself. Obviously. In that respect, he's utterly fickle. Well, I am disappointed, I must say. Thorvaldson. My father had a primary school teacher named Miss Thorvaldson. Well, of course. I I'm going for a walk. Don't leave me. I mean, what's going on here? I am going around the block. It's not often I get to be a tourist. You disappoint me, too. Ladies. Lyra. So, I wasn't allowed to dance, or even to learn how. But I'll tell you what I once did. Twice a year, some of the wealthier palm families would get together and give a ball in one of the large barns. None of this square dancing country stuff. A genuine ball with tie and tails and gowns and an orchestra and waltzing. Wait a minute. Excuse me, please, but who are you? Inga Torvaldson. My father's primary school teacher? Well, not anymore, of course. Of course. And my father's 70. And you were retirement age when you taught him. So that makes you about 130 years old? Oh, for goodness sake, who's counting? And more to the point, I suppose, how are you counting? Anyway, when I was 13, I escaped my parents somehow one night and trekked across the fields to the old Benson farm. I climbed up into the rafters of the barn and I don't like this. I don't like miracles. Nothing I've seen since has moved me as the sight of those waltzing couples that night. My father invited you? Spinning, spinning, a blur in my eyes. Faster than the speed of light. Oh, at least. And the music. Can you imagine how it struck my ears? Thirteen years old and did nothing between them until that night. Him, tunes and an old pump organ. Are any of the others... Here? Is Ira really here? My sister? Anyone? I had to pay for my night of sin, of course. Old Benson's nephew, Willie. Family crouching up there, spellman. Oh, a beautiful young man. Raven hair, dressed in black and dark eyes and pink, pink skin. Of course, he may have just had too much cider to drink, but anyway, he lifted me up, led me down and asked me for the honour of a dance. Is this, is this house empty? He couldn't speak, not a word. And then, to my horror, I began to cry. All of them standing about me in a circle, and Willie Benson at my arm, and while a moment earlier they had all been laughing, now they began to clear their throats and cough quietly, and all I wanted to tell them was how beautiful I thought they had been, spinning, and how I didn't want them to stop, ever. But I couldn't utter a word. Do you know the sensation? Willie was very kind. He bundled me up in a blanket and pitched, perched me up beside him on his carriage and 
flicked his whip over the horse's head and drove me home, telling me jokes and stories all the way, although I answered him not a word. I had fallen in love. Did I ever tell you that story, Mr. Wright? Uh, yes, Ingo. So. Two years later, he took his own life. There was no connection, of course. He hadn't fallen in love with a child or anything like that. I never knew what it was. He hanged himself from the rafters in his father's barn. You I smell muffins. <laughs> I should say you do. <laughs> Miss Thorvaldson. Do call me Inga. Your story. Where's the lesson? There are no lessons, only stories. I am no longer a school teacher. Miss Thorvaldson, do you know what I really write for that paper in New York? Not the headlines? Oh, yes. But the ones I really have to write for my living every day, they're like father slays son and self. Calcutta kids trampled, 24 dead. Hurricane havoc in retirement haven. Second infant found in incinerator. Please. It just goes on and on. Pension couples starve in West Side rooming house. Third incinerator baby found. Terminal. It's all terminal. I'm sorry, Joe. I just, I have no more lessons in me. Father slays son. Dear God, have mercy on us. Son and self. Son and self. Son and self. Son and self. As if all the natural loss with which we are encumbered weren't enough. Remember that situation in Montana? We had a parish out there in the early years. That was the other way around. Son slay father and self. Now, of course, you weren't born yet. But you told him about it. I remember. An unbending man he was towards his son. A stiff-necked man. The poor boy's name was Roger. Son and self. Father and self. I left the seminary, you know. I didn't know. Oh, yes, indeed. For nearly two years. After your training, you had doubts? Doubts? I had no doubts. For two years I did my work. I studied and read and wrote and thought for two years, so conscientiously, because I was preparing myself to serve. And then, with a face like milk, I marched forth into the field. Rise up, O man of God, have done with lesser things. Yes, sir, thank you. The field being a tiny parish outside Fargo, North Dakota, 241 in the congregation. And by the end of six months, I knew more about those 241 men, women and children, body and soul, than I ever wanted to know about anyone. I couldn't go on. Serve them. I couldn't even face them. 
They were so full of want. And what had I to give them? Everything for me. You had everything to give, always. So I quit. Couldn't face my family. Couldn't face myself. I was actually going to form a one-man Protestant monastery, emphasis on protest. Like Jacob, I was going to spend my entire life alone wrestling with the angel. Wrestling. But you didn't. No, I... I met your mother. Oh, go on, Arthur. And coming to love her, and being loved by her, somehow I came to realize that anyone who is awake must look at the universe in all its I must say either yes or no and to say no would be to take death into one's arms and by that time I was already married. Our first child died in Montana. She was four days old. Rise up, O oh men of God, have done with lesser things. If heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Anger. No more for me, thanks. No. Have you met my young friend, Joe? Ah, uh, only in an offhand sort of way, I'm afraid. Joseph, meet Mr. Orville Wright. Uh, hello, Orville. How are you? Uh, a little tired, but who's complaining? Want a muffin? <clears throat> sure. I guess I'm a little tired, too. Of course you are. Well, congratulations. Why, thank you. Uh, of course, equal credit goes to uh, my big brother. <laughs> of course. Ada, crack me. Here it was, my silly idea in the first place, and then you end up doing all the work. Oh, listen to that. You don't have uh, whippoorwills out this far west, do you, Arthur? Oh, by invitation, horrible. Ah. Uh, their cousin, the Nighthawk, yes, but... Uh... Both of them we found extremely difficult to study, being birds of the night. Uh, and their flight, so rapid and erratic, this way and that. <laughs> but you can be sure that many a moth is tumbling dim-witted into its beak at this very moment. There was a whippoorwill that kept us company on Kill Devil Hill, all during the trials. For four years, Wilbur used to say the creature was mocking our clumsy efforts to fly, and he may have been correct. Even after we succeeded, I mean, there is flight, and there is flight. Don't you agree, Joe? Uh-huh. Dad? I'm here, Joe. No, for study... We had much better luck with the vultures, actually. You say you boys picked up your mechanical flair from your mother? Oh. 
father could fix anything. And she was a kindred spirit for the time, almost a, a conspirator with us boys. Once, when father was away uh, out on the evangelical circuit, I took a machine can and filled it with water and put it on the stove. Uh, I was about nine. After a little while, of course, the boiling water came squirting out the top about a foot or two. <laughs> it also went all over the kitchen floor, naturally. Uh, but mother, when she came running into the room, had no word of remonstrance for me, none. And when I clapped with joy, she applauded that machine can too. I remember it was in that same week our old cat died. <laughs> Wilbur was the one who took care of mother while she was trying to die some years later. I was 17 and my brother 21 and in poor health himself after a rather bad accident ice skating. Uh, and then we, we lost mother. And then we learned how to fly. And then just a matter of years, the typhoid took Wilbur off. Loss after loss. But he went away much too soon. <laughs> he used to say that the whippoorwill was mocking our desire to fly, and the vultures were mocking our desire for fame. <laughs> the whippoorwill is a voice in the dark. Hulk, did you see that? I always said you were an observant boy. Look, another. There you go, Dad. See, Joe? I think it's starting. Oh, two at a time. Ader, I knew it. It was just the calm before the storm. It was worth it, wasn't it? The, the waiting. Isn't it exciting, Mr. Ryan? Miraculous. Jean, get out here. Jean, Mike. Oh, I've never seen such a storm. Where's Ira? Ira? Ira! No, hush. You wake the dead. Ira! Who wanted the orange juice? See, Ada, there's no stopping it now. Wow! Tommy! Tommy! Will you look at that, Uncle Joe? Tom! What's going on? Gee, you're just in time. Look! Amazing! Isn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, for Pete's sake, I forgot your shirts. No, wait. Yeah, my shirts, it's all dried out now anyway. Yeah? Well, sort of. There! I've missed you. I've missed you too. And Jerry and the kids and everyone. I've missed everybody. Hi, Joe. I, I heard you calling for me. I was calling for you. I know. I heard. Ira? Mr. Sherman, you got that from the neighbors. Oh, um... Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Wouldn't you love to give this to someone as a wedding gift? Yeah, someone you really disliked? That's Mr. Albright's stag. Well, you must tell me all about this Mr. Albright sometime. <laughs> Ira, look. Oh, my God. My father, the bishop, used to quote a line from the New Testament about a God who calls into existence things that are not. I'm glad you're here. Oh, you called for me. I know. It's a first, I think. 
maybe, I don't know, maybe with practice? Maybe. Oh, I bet we could see it better from over there on the riverbank. Don't you dare. <clears throat> Nobody moves. Everyone, everyone, just hold it right where you are. No more muffins, no more coming and going, no orange juice, no riverbank, just stop. Stay. Please. I am grateful. I want you to know that I'm grateful, but would you please just stay here and let me enjoy it for God's sake. Hold on to it, together. The night, the damn bird out there, the waltzing. Orville, Orville. Dad, why didn't you ever tell me it was him who landed that plane? Or maybe you did. You must have. Mom, you must have told me about the baby then Montana that died and I just forgot. How could I do that? Ira, your face in the light of the television and the Christian Marxists of Minnesota, Jean. All those letters I tried to ignore, all that stuff I just threw away, all that ignoring, all of that throwing away. Joey. Dad. You don't have to throw away a thing. But you're going to have to let go. I haven't seen him so excited since one day when he was 16 months old. It's um, a regular shower, isn't it, Grandpa? It's a downpour. Isn't it terrific? Mom? Sure is. So, Jean, how do you like it? What do you call it? Hmm. All bright. Of course. I'll call you. Long distance? No. I'll see you soon. Okay. I feel as though I was 13 years old again. Miss Thorlson, let's just waltz on out onto the lawn, shall we? Orville, oh, you know I don't. Ah, it's simple. One, two, three, and all of that. Come on. <laughs> just a matter of mathematics, believe me. One, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> There's no... Getting over it, I suppose, is there? Your death? In a sense? I don't suppose. Sense. That will keep us with you. If you're careful. Suppose. The house feels as empty as me. As empty as I. As empty as I. Paul. Drop him a note from time to time. He'd appreciate it. I know he would. All right, Mom. And don't forget Jean's birthday anymore. It falls so close to Christmas. She's always being neglected. I promise. Uh, Michael looks up to you. Joe, he admires you. That's a responsibility. Maybe I'll invite him out to New York before the school term starts. Ira could take him to Coney Island. That sounds fine. Thank you, Mom. Dad. For all of it. It was nothing. 
they won't be coming back, will they? Oh, I don't know. Sooner or later, they all come back. Arthur, I'm here. Arthur offers her his arm and Ada takes it. Two of them walk slowly across the porch steps and across the lawn into the darkness, looking up at the sky. Joe slowly turns and approaches the house. He opens the screen door and Tom, a sleep to 15 year old boy, walks out and exits. He walks onto the lawn. Joe looks after him. Good luck at Oboe Camp. Joe turns and opens the screen door. He finds the inner door locked. He takes keys from his pocket, opens the door and goes into the empty house. Slow fade, blackout. <laughs>